Kia ora and salamu alaikum. Welcome to our woman leading in politics, uh, ways to promote cohesion uh, in Aotearoa panel. I acknowledge our three panelists, um, Priyanka Ratakrishnan, Gauris Garaman, and Dr. Pamjit Parma. Thanks for joining us and thanks for accepting our invitation. Um, the conversation will be facilitated by Tayaba Khan, CEO of the Khatija Leadership Network. Uh, my thanks to you for collaborating us once again and for making this event possible. I would like to also acknowledge Anne Parler, who's in the audience tonight, um, community advocate, engagement consultant, and company director. She will represent New Zealand First in the West Auckland uh, Kelston lectorate. Um, I realise it's been a very rainy and windy day, so I do appreciate all of you attending. Uh, we do have our, our online viewers as well, watching through YouTube. So just a little bit about my organisation, Pearl Islands Foundation. We aim to foster understanding and acceptance between people of diverse communities through meaningful engagement and intercultural events. These events are one of those. These spaces, they create an environment in which we promote dialogue. So by engaging with people around us, we shatter stereotypes and attempt to understand one another. These interactions are an important opportunity in this regard. So what exactly is social cohesion? So OECD defines social cohesion as networks together with shared norms, values, and understandings that facilitate cooperation within or among groups. A 2013 paper by Schmitz and Cummins provides a robust framework of social cohesion, one that integrates both participation and trust. Participation broadly translates to having thriving communities, strong social connections, and increased political participation, whereas trust refers to trust in society, trust in institutions, and trust in political parties. Social cohesion involves building shared values and communities, reducing disparities in wealth and income, enabling people to have a sense that they are engaged in a common pursuit and facing a shared challenge. Discrimination and racism is real in Aotearoa. Muslims witnessed this in the most extreme and vile form last year. Our Asian communities have encountered this following the emergence of the coronavirus. Despite living in one of the most peaceful nations on earth, we now know that even New Zealand is prone to despicable acts of terror and discrimination. This is why we must not be complacent and this is what our organisation works towards. We have to continue to work on building stronger and resilient individuals, communities, institutions that ultimately promote cohesion within Aotearoa. Before I end my welcome speech, I would like to um, just do a short prayer, um, like a karakia, I guess. Praise be to God who has created us and made us into tribes and nations that we may know each other and help each other, not that we may despise each other. May we, may we be united around the principles of love, justice, faith and peace. May God put peace and love in our hearts for the diversity that makes our nation so beautiful. May our hearts with, fill, our, fill with generosity, kindness and compassion so that we may treat those around us with mutual respect. We remember the 51 persons who were killed last year who lost their eyes on March 15. We pray for the end of the coronavirus, which has taken the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world. We pray for everyone affected by the blast that has rocked Beirut. May God grant strength to the people of Lebanon as they recover from this tragedy. Amen. Just some housekeeping rules before I pass it on to my friend Tayaba. Um, if the fire alarms go off, like they just did, we actually must evacuate. We can't stand still, okay? Um, so we live through the exit doors, so one over here and one over here. The toilets are just located on the right-hand side, just outside. So let me introduce Tayaba before I pass it on to her, who will actually uh, facilitate this corredor over here. Um, Tayaba Khan's whakapapa of forced displacement inevitably led to two decades of serving migrant and refugee communities in government and third sector roles. Having now lived and worked in New Zealand, Palestine, Australia and the UK with the opportunity to apply her interdisciplinary qualifications of mental health and international development, Tayaba is deeply passionate about working with minority and faith-based communities. Her latest voluntary passion includes building up the Khatija Leadership Network and representing the European Muslim League as their New Zealand Ambassador for Peace. I'm also aware that she is recently appointed to the board of Amnesty International in New Zealand um, please join me in welcoming Tayaba. Thank you, Yasser. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Kia ora. 
uh, so that was a very uh, <clears throat> awkward introduction when you hear about yourself and you, you, know, <laughs> you almost feel a little embarrassed. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so I'm going to start off with introducing our wonderful panel this evening. Um, so I'll read a bit about their bios. I mean, they're already pretty famous, but, you know, these bios are pretty good and there are some gems in here and you want to know about them. Um, so I'll start with Gurez. Uh, Gurez is an Iranian Kiwi refugee, uh, lucky to escape war and persecution as a child. Her studies at Oxford and her career as a lawyer in New Zealand and overseas uh, have focused on enforcing human rights and holding governments to account. Gorez worked for the United Nations Tribunal as part of both defense for Rwanda, the former Yugoslavia, and prosecution Cambodia teams. Her work also included restoring communities after war and human rights atrocities, particularly empowering women engaged in peace and justice initiatives. Gorez has a long-standing involvement in refugee and migrant rights activism and is a prominent member of the Iranian community. Her expertise as a human rights and constitutional lawyer will help bring effective legislation, legislative solutions for social justice, climate, and environmental issues. Gorez made history as the first ever refugee to be sworn in as an MP. Could we give her a round of applause? <laughs> All good, this is, this is about you guys. Um, uh, I'll go to Priyanka now. So Priyanka Radhakrishnan has lived and worked overseas um, and in Aotearoa, New Zealand. She was born in India, went to school in Singapore, and then moved to New Zealand to further her education. She has a Master's in De of Development Studies from Victoria University and chose to make Aotearoa her home. Priyanka has worked with our diverse communities across Aotearoa. She's committed to ensuring their voices are heard in Parliament and that they're supported to thrive. In 2019, she was appointed the Parliamentary Private Secretary to the Minister for Ethnic Communities. Priyanka is a proud union member. She's also a, a member of the Asia New Zealand Foundation Leadership Network, National Council of Women in Auckland, and UN Women. She's a member of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Select Committee and Deputy Chair of the Social Services and Community Select Committee. She's busy. If we could give her a round of applause. Uh, and last but not least, Dr. Paramjeet Parmar. She is the Nationalist MP based in Mount Roskill and is the opposition spokesperson for research, science and innovation and associate spokesperson for economic development. Dr. Parmar became the first Indian-born woman to be a member of parliament in New Zealand in 2014 general election. She holds a PhD in biological sciences from the University of Auckland. And prior to entering parliament, Dr. Parmar worked as a scientist, a businesswoman, a broadcaster, and a community advocate. Naturally community-minded, Dr. Parmar has also served as a family's commissioner, a community representative on the film and video labeling body, and as chair of an association helping victims of domestic violence. Along with her professional background, her background as an immigrant gave her the opportunity to understand the importance of the rich and diverse cultures that create a large part of New Zealand's identity. Could we all welcome Dr. Parmar? Hey, so guys, how we've organized this evening for you is that the theme tonight is social cohesion. So we've got these three wonderful politicians here tonight um, who have no idea what questions I'm going to ask them other than the themes. So we are going to be putting them on the spot, which should be entertaining for us all. Uh, <laughs> um, so guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you to maybe rotate the mic with whoever feels most inclined to answer first. Let's, let's go with that. And this is going to be the hardest question of the evening. So that's what we'll start off with. Um, so the question is, what is your one superpower that an MP must have? <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> Should I just speak? Can everyone hear me? 
Can you hear me in the back? That's great. He, he can use YouTube for live streaming. Oh, for live streaming, sorry. Okay. Kia ora koutou katoa, nga mihi nui kia koutou. Um, can I just begin by thanking you both, Yasser and um, Teaba, and your organisations, Pearl of the Island Foundation and the Khadija Leadership Network for tonight's event, and uh, for the opportunity to be here. Um, a superpower, I've, I have to admit that I've never been asked that before, uh, so that's really interesting, but I think I would say what I've found most useful is being able to listen, actually. And that would be, um, uh, I guess, honed over years of being a social worker and working with people. But being able to listen and empathize with a range of people's experiences, um, I think, is really important for a member of parliament. Right. Thank you. And can I also start by acknowledging you, Thayaba? And uh, I want to acknowledge Pearl of the Islands for organizing this evening and your organization as well, Akatija Leadership Network. Thank you. And thank you to each and every one of you. And um, I would say that my superpower is determination. <laughs> because I you know, grew up in India. And uh, that's not the main reason. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm one of the four girls. And you know, if you know India, and if you know, you know there is kind of a preference for a boy child over a girl child. And there is always this feeling that boys should be educated more than girls because girls' job in some families, I'm not generalizing, not in every family, because it didn't happen in my family. So you know, people believe that, okay, girls should have a degree. That's enough for them to get married to a nice you know, guy. And for guys, they are more ambitious. But for me, it was my family wanted to make sure that I have um, and, you know, achieved in education. That was first thing. And yes, I achieved in education, and then I wanted to do a PhD. And um, I decided that I'll definitely do a PhD. I got married. I didn't let that my ambition go away. So when I came to New Zealand to join my husband here, I said, look, this is something I really want to do. So that is another example of my determination. I started my PhD after I got married. And this is after having my first child. And then I had my second child before finishing my PhD. And then um, you know, in um, all these um, you know, places that I have worked in, it's all about understanding how the system works and how I can best contribute uh, you know, for everybody that is involved in the system and also for the wider community. That has been my aim and that has been my determination. So it's a real privilege and honor to be a member of parliament. And as a member of parliament, this is, I think, something that is of um, high value because you know there is a lot of learning. I'm a second term member of parliament. A lot of learning, um, and then after that, you also want that opportunity to apply that learning as soon as possible, and also to see where you can utilize your background. So background is not just your educational background, your cultural background, and your you know experiences that you have gained, um, you know, being um, a mother, being a member of the community, being involved in so many other things. So you try to utilize all that background in this role, and for that, you have to be really determined because I am from the National Party. And in national, um, we have 55 MPs. And all of my colleagues are really intelligent people. They all want to contribute. So you can imagine when every, everybody wants to contribute, you have to be really determined. You can't give up. You continue with your you know, assertion and uh, continue with the, uh, the thing that you want to see happen. And then finally, I have realized that it does happen. Thank you. Um, this is absolutely life affirming. I say this every time you organize an event. Um, but thank you um, to everyone who's organized this, the, the um, organizations, the individuals, and for all of you to, for turning up, because we don't often see women of color on a stage together like this from across the political spectrum um, asked to, to kind of talk and talk for the whole event, right? <laughs> it's just us. It's just us, guys. Um, I think the superpower for me has been, um, that I think we have to have a really deep belief in democracy. And I say that as someone who's seen the world without it. Um, it, we do have a really thriving democracy here in New Zealand, but I do find that in Parliament we sometimes get caught up in that party politics and, and the adversarialness of it all. But we have to kind of keep going back to that core value that people want us to work together to get things done. Um, so, you know, whether in my life that's been, you know, to go off and work for the United Nations and some of the worst 
um, post-atrocity context where it's like, no, we will have justice. We will, we will set up a court and we will sort out, you know, and, and exactly tonight's event, you know, and the theme of social cohesion comes back to some of those ethnic um, divisions and conflicts, but we will come back to kind of a core of democracy and human rights and we will have the rule of law and we will sort this out with the kind of respect that all members of our society deserve. And when you go into parliament, it's about respecting all the other elected members and kind of working together to, to come up with the best solutions for Aotearoa. Mm, thank you. So amazing superpowers, huh? listening, determination, and a deep belief in democracy. Oh, this is going to be an interesting panel tonight. All right, so the second question, guys, if you're ready for it. COVID has been a slight blip, I don't know about you guys, but you know, kind of changed plans for the world at large. Um, the audience tonight would love to hear how your part, what are the challenges your parties are seeing as a result of COVID? And how are those challenges being implemented in your party policies? Well, <laughs> do you want me to go first? Go for it. <laughs> um, I'm in a funny position in the sense that I'm uh, in the Green Party is in government, but I'm not, um, <laughs> and I have a lot of a lot of portfolios uh, where I'm actually in opposition in a funny way. Um, so the COVID crisis brought us together. Um, it was incredible, and we, we did come through it because we have more or less a cohesive cooperative society, and for me, as someone who suffers from multiple sclerosis, as one of the vulnerable people in the community, it was incredible to watch everybody go into lockdown with so much determination, um, so much cooperation, so much love, um, so that those of us who were really vulnerable could be safe. And what we learnt, I think, is that um, when there is a crisis, and I think this goes for any social crisis, um, we, none of us will be okay unless all of us are. So, um, so that goes for inequality, it goes for the climate crisis. Um, and some of what I saw that was a little bit heartbreaking was that our migrant communities weren't taken care of. And we know, we know that our migrant communities weren't given access to the emergency benefit. And we, we all locked down because we had access to that support. You know, we all know someone who was accessing the subsidy and we all know someone who, you know, um, was getting help a different way. And we know that migrants are here in the workforce filling essential service gaps and, and, and essential skills and they weren't given access to the support that they needed in order to lock down safely. And I must, you know, that must have been terrifying. So we didn't take care of everyone, but we did, we did show that as a community, if we want to, we can, and we so quickly put our homeless whānau into, into care. We put roofs over people's heads. We m made sure that elderly were taken care of. We did it. Um, we just have to kind of weave that, that kind of love and that cooperation into the more enduring fabric of our society and look deeper at the prejudices that kept us from taking care of some of the most marginalised in our, in our communities. I mean, we all acknowledge that um, it has been quite tough, especially uh, lockdown time. Uh, you know, in Mount Roskill, where I'm based, this place is in Mount Roskill, we were calling around and I found there were a lot of people there, disabled, their caregivers couldn't come, so we had to look after them indirectly and directly as well. Um, but, you know, now looking at this whole uh, COVID uh, and situation and now post-COVID for us here in New Zealand, there are two things that we need to keep in mind. One is the health of our people, and the second thing is the economy. So what we want to see now is health and economy going hand in hand. So it can't be one or the other. So yes, we um, did act on it um, as soon as um, New Zealand was hit by COVID, but we were lucky in the sense that we were one of the latter countries to be hit by COVID-19. So we had this opportunity to learn from other countries what was happening there. So we went into lockdown. But my little frustration is that we went into lockdown, our country went into lockdown before the borders were closed. So if borders were closed before we going into lockdown, maybe we would not have lost those 22 people, those who died because of COVID in New Zealand. 
because this is the first time we have realized you know how um, it's become such a significant thing that we are so cut off from the world. Otherwise, we have been always complaining. So there was that real opportunity to save these lives as well. So I'll always regret, you know, we couldn't save those lives, 22 people, those who died. But we cannot afford any more lives going because of COVID-19. But on the other hand, there are lives being lost because of other th issues that have come up because of lockdown because our economy has definitely gone down. You would have seen the GDP growth is sliding down. There is this temporary provision for keeping people in employment through wage subsidy scheme, which is going to finish just in the first week of September. Around 450,000 people are going to become jobless. And currently, we know there are a lot of people underemployed, underutilized. They want more hours of work. They are not getting that. So yes, the support is there through the benefit system. But that is not people want, you know, they, they really want to be in jobs. And you know, here, because we are all women, one thing that I want to highlight is that during COVID, out of 11,000 jobs which were lost, 10,000 of those people were women. 10,000 out of 11,000. I ask why? Because still, you know, people believe that if you have a choice, you know, you have to make somebody redundant then they look at a female first. Why? So that is a big question that we need to answer as politicians and as community organizations, that there shouldn't be this kind of, I mean, obviously there is this unconscious bias. That's why we have seen 10,000 women out of 11,000 total people that became unemployed. Now for jobs, we have to support businesses because governments don't create jobs. Businesses create jobs. Government's job is, uh, government's main job is to provide that environment for businesses to flourish, to thrive, to employ another person, to take that risk. And we have, for policy, to answer your question, we have announced Business Start, which is about helping people access their KiwiSaver Saver to uh, start up a business, because now a lot of people are losing their jobs. And they may not find another job, so they m might want to start a business. They might have a bright idea. Why not? Give them that opportunity to start their own business. So that is what we are doing through Kiwi Saver because it's their own saving. It's for that rainy day, and this is the rainy day when they need that money. Second is job um, start. This is about businesses, those who want to employ another staff. So there will be a support of $10,000 for six months, but it will be given in such a manner that businesses cannot just take that money and then lay off that, um, that staff member. We don't want that happening. So, um, and, but there is a lot more that we need to do. But I think that point about women, 10,000 out of 11, is a big issue uh, that we need to really tackle. Um, I do want to begin by acknowledging that um, the whole pandemic and the situation that the pandemic has put us in globally and in New Zealand has been tougher for some than others. And that includes those who have lost loved ones, lost jobs, and those who face uncertainty in their futures. So I just want to acknowledge that. I have, however, um, great pride in the work that the government did. We've never had a playbook for closing down a country. We've never had a playbook for dealing with a pandemic of this ilk that has, um, that has rocked us globally, frankly. I mean, when we went into lockdown, we had about, from memory, it was about 243,000 cases globally. Today, we have about 19 million oh, across the world. The pandemic is actually surging. It's not getting any better. And that's why the decision was made right at the start here in New Zealand to go hard and go early. It wasn't luck. It was actually listening to scientific advice, to expert medical advice, and taking that advice and acting on it. Going hard and going early into alert level four lockdown, um, has actually brought us to where we are today with the, um, uh, you know, 100 days of no community transmission, of unemployment that is at about 4.4% uh, as opposed to the Treasury projections of 8%. Uh, the, the economic... Um, it, it's not actually wrong, that's, that's it's correct. The number, Can I speak? I'm yeah, sorry, you, it's my you, turn to yeah, speak. Yes, I think you've had yours. yours. Um, so it, it, it's about the wage subsidy scheme that provided that uh, connection between employers and their workers so that when we came out of lockdown, 
um, companies had their workers who could come back to work and that workers had money to put food on their tables throughout lockdown um, as well. So it was all those um, measures that were taken. Equally, it was the leadership of our Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, the clarity of her communication and the fact that the alert level system was put in place so that people knew what was expected of them and what to expect um, going forward as well. Because, they, you know, the word unprecedented has been bandied about so much, but it's so true. When have we ever had to close our borders and put an entire country into lockdown? But now we need to ensure that the border regime that we have continues to be one of the strongest in the world because, as I said previously, the pandemic continues to surge. What we have control over is how we protect the lives and livelihoods of New Zealanders going forward. So that regime needs to continue, but equally we need to invest in our people. And we have a five-point action plan, economic action plan, that's already put in motion. It's about investing in people, ensuring that we have opportunities for pe people to train and retrain as the job market changes. So apprenticeships, free trades training in critical areas like mental health, like aged care, like counselling, in addition to the building and construction work. It's about creating jobs. C governments can and do create jobs. It's about investing also in the environment. There's an economist co called Joseph Sticklitz that I've read for many years. He talks about a double duty. So creating jobs to ensure that people um, have those jobs to get into, but equally doing them in a way that you do good for the country. And that's by creating jobs in areas like housing, in the environment, so that you protect the environment as well while you create jobs. It's about investing in our small businesses because it's true that they're a, a massive part of our economy. And we're doing that through interest-free loans, tax relief that's provided to them, uh, and the wage subsidy scheme. The COVID income relief payment as well that has actually had a lower uptake than we thought it would have because businesses have been picking up in most sectors. And finally, it's about making sure that we strengthen our position globally, that we continue with the trade agreements that we are uh, pursuing and that we diversify our trade negotiations um, as well. Just a final point on migrants, because um, as, you know, I, I do push back a little bit that there was nothing for migrants because I was actually quite involved in some of the work that was rolled out, both in terms of the um, investment into NGOs who provided a huge amount of support for our migrant communities regardless of their immigration status through food parcels and lots of other types of support. Um, the government's support to ensure that everyone had a place where, we, where they could self-isolate. And that is important because we've seen overseas in countries where that wasn't provided and the second wave has really come in um, uh, because of large migrant communities that didn't have that support. And also ensuring that visas were extended so that there was a little bit of certainty um, and that materials were translated so that even communities where English was a second language they were able to access the health messages that government was putting out. But I do accept that there's a lot more that needs to be done as well. No, no. Guys, is there a way for the second mic to work? Oh, it's just, I, I do want to kind of jump in and can't because I don't have a mic. So. That's good. <laughs> Yeah, they don't want to give me a mic and I want to, you know, jump in. Um, did you guys feel that slight little tension between them just in a moment? Yeah, I did too. I was like, this is the moment to jump in as the MC, but I couldn't, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could. I could do the moves and um, that's how we'll play it for the rest of the evening. <laughs> Um, that was really helpful, guys. Thank you so much. And it's really, I don't know how you guys found it, but it's helpful to know how parties are actually operating and responding to COVID-19 um, and where they sit in terms of their positions. So following on from that, I guess the general feeling for the population is that things are economically going to get slightly worse or tighter or some are going to really feel the effects of it. And so my next question for you guys is around what are your policies to support those who will really feel the pinch once the wage subsidies are over, once these packages do come to an end? What are the plans in terms of supporting those who will be most affected? Um, 
Okay, I'm going to pass it on now. Is that? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I did mention a little bit about Job Start and Business Start before. So we are rolling out more policies to support people. So these are people, those who are so used to being in employment. And imagine somebody is used to working all their life and all of a sudden they are told that the job doesn't exist because this temporary measure that has been put in place is going to come to an end. And by first week of September, I don't see a big um, you know, change in um, the situation um, that the businesses all of a sudden will start feeling better. But obviously, they will start feeling better depending on the sector that they're involved in compared to when we were in lockdown. Like, for example, some restaurants, tourist industry, I mean, they, are feeling, they were you know, up really, really down. And tourist industry is still down, but then our restaurants, takeaways, small businesses that we see here around here in Mount Roscoe, they are very happy to reopen. But do they have the, uh, that ability to employ another person? That is where we need to support them so that they can come back full and come back better. So um, Job Start is one of those schemes where they can employ that person, they can get the support of $10,000. Business Start, I mentioned before, that people can access their own saving to start up a business. But you know, when we talk about this issue, of job losses. It's not just one person that loses that job. It's that whole family that suffers because of that job loss. So it's not just one individual. And it's not just about money. It's a lot more than that. It's about that person's mental health. It's about domestic violence that we have seen has risen significantly during lockdown and now also. Number of suicides. I mean, I'm hearing the community. I met someone who um, recently lost her son. And you know, these kind of stories are really hard to absorb. And these are the things that are happening within our community. So there has to be a proper fix. It has to be a long-term fix. It has to be more than providing these jobs. So yes, the jobs should be available as soon as possible, because that will be a fix for other issues that are evolving because of these job losses. You would have seen in South Auckland, one um, business owner that was in media uh, committed suicide. And then there was another story of another business person. So we want to make sure that these businesses that are feeling the pinch of COVID, feeling that pinch still from that lockdown, are able to get that support. They feel supported um, from, and it is the role of the government to support businesses. And I say this again, that it is not the role of government. Governments get it wrong when they believe that it's their role to create jobs. Asking people to go and kill possums and rats, that's not the way to create jobs. When you support business, when you provide that environment, when businesses know they can invest, then they can create more jobs. That is what we want. And they will create not only jobs, but they will create higher paying jobs as well. And I'm also the spokesperson for research, science, and innovation. And I want to say this, you know, there are a lot of uh, good scientific companies in New Zealand. And it was really disappointing to see that a lot of startup companies, because research and development is a high risk thing. So if you're running your business in these times, you don't want to invest in research and development because you don't know if it's going to work or not. You just want to stay steady. If you're making this you know, kind of cup, you want to continue making this kind of cup. You don't want to modify this cup. You don't want to bring another product because you don't know if that's going to work or not. But you know, you will do better if you have a good strategy to invest in research and development, because in the long run, that does pay off. And I'm advocating for governments to invest more in research and development in terms of giving that ability to businesses. And here, startup companies, they don't have any, you know, uh, profit. They keep investing in research and development. They continue to do that. And those companies were not eligible for wage subsidy scheme that was announced by government. So I had to advocate for that scheme to be extended to R&D startup firms. It took me two months, but finally they became eligible. And there are a lot of other things that we need to do. So this time, I think the, the other thing that we need is innovation in our country, because we need to continue to compete at global level. And for that, if we continue to produce what we currently produce, that may not be enough, because the world is changing, world's needs are changing. And we want to give that ability to our businesses. And that is what, as a spokesperson and as a scientist myself, I am really keen to do for our businesses. Yeah, I would I'd just like to thank you for supporting the um, Green Investment Fund. Um, <laughs> um, 
No, well, exactly. No, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Just sounded like you were coming over, you know. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Doris. <laughs> Was it <that> normal tea? <laughs> It was green tea. Um, <laughs> um, These jokes are getting a little scary, guys. Um, yeah, so jobs have to be sustainable, and that's why we have the Green um, Investment Fund. But I think uh, what we've learned uh, from COVID is, is that people do need that social safety net, and it's about dignity. Um, it, 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 and it is about social cohesion because we all know that something can happen in each of our lives that may mean that we will need to access a safety net. And that's one of the first things I remember about New Zealand, you know, arriving here as refugees and uh, suddenly realising that we have rights, you know, and that's special. That's something that's incredibly special about New Zealand. We have a, a healthcare system, an education system, we have um, a social welfare system, a, a disability support, and all of those things are so eroded now that when I look back, you know, we are really rebuilding over this past term um, th these core Kiwi values that I really prized um, because our systems, our public services were so eroded, um, our state houses were so sold off, our, our hospitals were barely functioning. Um, so I think uh, uh, knowing that we can kick into gear and we can take care of each other um, and, and provide it with dignity. And I think that's what I take issue um, with in terms of the way that migrants were, were treated because it was just food parcels and, and an ad hoc support system that wasn't um, there to provide dignity in the way that those who lost their jobs as a result of COVID were provided with because we recognise that it could be any of us and that's the kind of country we want to live in. Um, so the Greens have a poverty action plan. Um, it's fully costed. Um, it does mean that those of us with the most, so millionaires, will have to pay 1% more tax on the amount of equity and, and income they have that's over a million dollars. Turns out it affects only 6% of us, and it turns out it would provide a basic income for everyone who would need it. That's the kind of society that we want to live in, because we know it could be any of us. We don't want a system that's punitive um, and strips people of, of their dignity. Um, but beyond that, we have the Green Investment Fund. We have um, the $3 billion that just got invested into um, environmental jobs, and that will mean science and innovation too. Within that is built um, training and education for people who want to um, go into environmental and conservation fields, into solar um, and technology, because we know that the world that we're going into from now on will need to, need to have uh, industries that are sustainable. That's what climate justice is about. We can't just stop the industries and jobs that are polluting without providing people with pathways to employment um, and welfare that's, that's uh, sustainable in other industries. So that's what we're investing billions of dollars in um, as part of our work in government. Um, and I completely agree, mental health is, is a huge blight um, on, on our communities in terms of our rates of mental illness and, and unsupported, undiagnosed mental health issues. So the Greens policy is that at least our young people should have access to free mental health care whenever they need it, under 25s. All under 25s would have access to free mental health care in New Zealand um, under our, our Green policy. And in terms of social and domestic violence, again, you know, we do prize ourselves as being the country that first gave women the vote, and we are that country. But then we have these epidemic levels of domestic and sexual violence, gender-based crimes, um, that affect our women in every way. You know, they affect our ability to participate in, in the workforce, um, in democracy, um, and they affect our health and mental health, um, it, and it, it is something that it's time to resolve, and we've had in government now for the first time um, an Under Secretary for Domestic and Sexual Violence, who is Jan Logie, Green um, MP, and she has, working cooperatively um, across a bunch of ministries, um, one 
now two years ago now um, in, in the budget, um, the biggest investment in solving domestic and sexual violence of any government in New Zealand, so $320 million. And, and more than that, the agreement that cooperation has to happen across ministries, so whether that's health, whether it's justice, whether it's Pacific, whether it's Māori, community sector, there has to be cooperation before we can actually ad address this, um, this incredible challenge. Um, but then there's, there's the challenge that affects us all, and I think we can all say it, it's the housing crisis. <laughs> and that affects people's mental health, that affects people's ability to be well. It's, if you have a job and you're a teacher in Auckland right now, you can barely afford rent. You can't afford to buy a house, that's not even a, a, a dream anymore. We're losing literally teachers, one of the most respected, sustainable <laughs> of, um, of uh, jobs because we can't house people here in Auckland. So. For the Green Party, we just launched our housing um, plan as well over the weekend, and we want to get rid of the wait list. We want to build those those um, uh, state houses finally, but we want rental um, rental standards, rental security. We want people, as they do in, in places like Europe, to have livable homes that are warm and dry, um, but rent while they save to buy homes. Um, so it's about well-being that's holistic and sustainable for us. I think um, COVID has actually shone the spotlight on so much that we kind of knew in the periphery about needing strong structures in our society. The need to lift the wage floor for everyone, um, including those in female dominated uh, sectors through things like pay equity and what we hope to achieve in the next term, which is fair pay agreements, allowing people to work together with their employers to actually improve wages and conditions at, um, um, at jobs as well. So it's absolutely about ensuring that people can get into jobs. It's about ensuring that the jobs that people get into pay decent wages so that everyone can live with dignity. Part of being able to live with dignity is being able to access your public institutions. And what we inherited, and I, I think Goldrys has touched on that quite a bit, there's just so much to fix. What we've inherited was rundown hospitals. It was, I went to a classroom recently in, um, uh, in Mongkeke, in the electorate that I'm based in, where the principal showed me carpet that is, that is ripped in more places than there's actually carpet left on the floor. You know, walls, just structures that weren't um, suitable for children and growing classrooms, growing roles. As we see population increase, the fact that we have a shortfall of 70,000 houses and increasing number of children at schools, we need to fix that. We've invested a huge amount in education to date in terms of allowing schools, state schools to upgrade their classrooms and facilities um, and addressing the pressures of increasing role. But the more I speak to principals, the more I feel that that is just a dent in what has been a cumulative lack or cumulative neglect, actually. So there's a huge amount more to be done to ensure that our public institutions are accessible to everyone, regardless of who they are, where they come from, or the family situation, the socioeconomic um, um, you know, strata that they might be born into. And I think all of that plays to ensuring that we do so much more um, uh, t to build that as we rebuild and as we recover. And COVID, in a way, has given us an opportunity to be able to do that better. It's allowed us to have a bit of a, a pause and look at where we actually put our money in. How do we fix the, the years of neglect of, to the mental health sector? The fact that, you know, the reason we have had increasing suicides over years is because people needed to get to a point of crisis situation before they would get a referral. How do we now, what we are wanting to do is to roll out over the next five years um, uh, a mental health system where people get the care that they need, the support that they need, much earlier on in the piece. So you go to see your GP, often that's where you're diagnosed or diagnosed of needing some more help. And we want to get to a point where the GP can actually refer you then and there to someone in that primary health care clinic where you can get the support that you need. But we don't have the health force to be able to do that. And so that's where the apprenticeship and trades training comes into play.
How do we build our workforce so that we can actually roll out a system where everyone gets the need, the support that they need at the time that they need it? And that's the kind of thing that we're focused on. Mm. Thank you. That's, that's a lot to think about and a lot to pro process. Housing crisis, employment. Um, yeah, so look, let's go to a little bit of a lightweight subject for a little while. Um, social cohesion, in one word, what would that mean for you? Starting with you, Priyanka. One word when you think of social cohesion. I think it would come back to dignity for everyone. Um, it could be value as well, that everyone feels that, that they are valued, but you've got to look yeah. at it. <laughs> one <laughs> word, <Okay>. one word. <laughs> you said one super That's OK, that's OK. You guys are politicians. This happens. <laughs> before I say that one word, can I say, uh, when we talk about, can, can I, before, yeah, yeah. So when we talk about housing crisis, you know, it's really good that the current government is uh, good at highlighting crisis, but they don't highlight Kiwi Build. That was a big failure. So one word from me is inclusion. That is what social cohesion is for me. It's inclusion. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Equality. Thank you. Great. But I mean, this is why they are politicians, right? It would, we would be worried if they didn't jump in passionately to talk about <laughs> what they really felt. All right, so, so going on to social cohesion, the question is, what will, it is a, it is a complex construct. It's not one thing. What, what is your party's dedication to working towards a socially cohesive New Zealand? Um, yeah, so my word was equality. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think often when we talk about social cohesion, we place an onus on marginalised or minority groups to fit in and to assimilate and, and um, without providing substantive equality, um, we can't really accept that. And I'm um, grateful that we've opened this uh, event tonight by recognising and acknowledging uh, the Christchurch terror attack, which was, within living memory, um, the worst hate crime and act of terror that's happened in New Zealand. Uh, but I, I do remember as well, and, and I, th I think, you know, I received that news in a, in a way differently as sort of the so-called first refugee MP because I was getting the sort of the deluge of messages from the refugee and migrant communities that, that were related to my background at, with all of their fears and all of their anxieties that day. Um, and also with a sense of fear, I realised as the day went on, um, for me, because I was... I'd been known to receive death threats for having been presumed to be Muslim and, and, and known to be a refugee and known to be a Middle Easterner. And this was something I brought up in my first ever speech in Parliament. You know, I'd had, by that point, I'd had the experience of running as a candidate from that background and not realising how significant it would be, my face and my story would be to so many different people. Some of that meant love and a lot of it apparently meant hate. So as, as people from that, that background, <laughs> so to speak, when we become visible, we do, we do receive the, the prejudice and, and the kind of what looms in the darker corners of even New Zealand's society. Um, and so I did raise it and I had to say, you know that some some of um, some of those sitting in that house are also responsible for fanning the flames of, of some of that hate and the rhetoric that us those of us out in the street receive. Then you know we can't shed our skins. We walk around and we get we get the emboldened um, hate and prejudice and sometimes violence. And then 18 months later, Christchurch happened, um, and that community suffered. Um, the worst of the consequences of, of being excluded, being dehumanised um, over decades, and whether it's media, whether it's politics. So it's about recognising that that inequality exists, and, and it's about recognising that unless we do tell our stories and, and have space provided for us in leadership, whether it's in the corporate world, whether it's in democracy, whether it's um, in uh, 
media that we will continue to be kind of that dehumanised group. But that actually means that the systems have to change to include us in decision making because we're experiencing healthcare and roads and the justice system and the education system uh, differently. And that's okay. If those systems, if those decision making bodies open up to include us in our experiences, we will only be stronger as a whole. And that's cohesion. It's not assimilation. Um, so in terms of the Green Party policy, we have, we have three tenets in the Green Party, and people always think we're just environmental, but it's environmental sustainability, social responsibility, and appropriate decision making. And the decision making one is all about decision making being shared um, by affected communities. And once government recognises that there is no such thing as ethnic issues or women's issues, you know, that we are experiencing all issues and we need to be included, our decision-making bodies need to be diverse. Um, we won't sort of have the cohesion that we're all so hungry for, um, especially post-Christchurch. We can see New Zealand's committed to it, but now it's time to weave, weave that into an enduring fabric. I think we can't do that without also acknowledging our past. So it's about teaching our history in schools. It was Māori who stood up and said with the Muslim community that actually this inequality, its hate has existed for a couple of centuries here. So until we recognise and decolonise and, and empower our indigenous people as well, um, and that, in, that will include us as migrant communities, um, we, we won't sort of be um, as equal as we hope to be. But I think we now know that the love is there as it poured out after Christchurch, so we can kind of do it. Um, Taiwa, as you said, that it's a very complex, you know, um, subject. And a social cohesion, you can look at it at so many levels. So one word that I mentioned was inclusion. And another word that I would uh, mention, I mean, uh, it's respect. You know, that needs to come from your heart and mind for another person. And when you see that other person in front of you as an individual, rather than a male, a female, brown or non-brown. You know, you forget about their cultural background, but you just see that person's ability, the contribution that the individual is making, that's when the social cohesion will come. But it will take ages. Because, you know, um, as it was mentioned before, we uh, women earned the right to vote. We were the first country in the world. And then it took 40 years for the first, um, uh, you know, woman to become a member of parliament, 40 years after that. And when we talk about you know, gender parity, World Economic Forum says that uh, it will take up to uh, 2130, last time when I saw. So we are in 2020, 2130, to achieve gender parity in real sense. And you know, cohesion in New Zealand, I mean, we have to look at it at different levels. It's not just genders, it's also the ethnic diversity that we have. You know, as it was said before, all three of us, brown women, migrants, born overseas, you born overseas as well, yes, yeah, so all three of us born overseas. You know, for us, it's not just about male and female, it's also about brown women. How do we make inroads in this society, in this community? And how do we help bring that social cohesion by bringing that understanding of, you know, what these different cultures, different backgrounds, different upbringings have to offer? So for me, it's a very, very complex subject, and it is something that needs to come from community level, family level, and also government level. And from government level, government can pass legislations, you know, for this to happen in a way that we want it to, ideally, um, legislations can't fix that. It needs to come from us, from people. Have that ability to accept people that are coming to New Zealand. And if I just talk about, you know, some migrant histories here in New Zealand, they are not very old. You know, some of us, we are first generation or whether we are sixth generation, but we all have one thing in common, and that is the aspiration to do well. And I think if we focus on that, that our aspiration is to do well, we provide those opportunities, and if when everybody is getting those opportunities, then when people are happy, social cohesion will come. But when those opportunities are not there, that is where the social cohesion starts breaking down. So it's something, um, a job for each and every one of us in this room. It's not um, a job that can be done by one organization or the other organization, 
but it is um, for everybody, you know, a role to play in bringing social cohesion and having that understanding in the role that we can play. Yes, we have this very unique outlook in New Zealand of bicultural foundation of being Maori and Pakeha, but in real sense, we are so multicultural. And uh, that is slowly, you know, um, being seen, being observed, uh, more in places like Auckland than in other places. But now we are seeing that multiculturalism is increasing in other places too. So it is a process, as I said, you know, things in the past, I've given you two examples where it has taken time. So here it's going to take time, but we are moving in the positive direction. For me, I think it's about ensuring that we build a society where, I mean, sure, we're diverse as a society, whether we look at it from a gender perspective, ethnicity, age. Um, it's about being able to value who we are, to celebrate who we are, and it goes back to, I think, Yasser, you mentioned it in your um, introduction today, about participation. You know, creating a society where we, um, we've talked about breaking down some of those barriers so that people can participate. When we look at um, addressing poverty so that people can participate. When we ensure that we strengthen our public institutions so that everyone can access them. When we value our ethnic diversity um, and ensure that people from different ethnic backgrounds, ethnic minority communities, have a say in our decision making that we value, we don't just tolerate one another as we live on the fringes, but we actually celebrate and value who we are. And I think that's when we can have a voice, you know, when we, we don't talk about assimilation, and I'm glad that no one has um, so far talked about assimilation, but about ensuring that we do see the diversity, that we do see that we come from different backgrounds and contexts. And we actually celebrate that because that makes us strong as a nation. We don't discount it. We're not strong despite it. I believe we're strong because of it. But that also includes um, uh, ensuring that when we talk about inclusion, we make sure that, you know, so when we, I'll give you one example. When we build housing, we ensure that we build accessible housing because we have an aging population. We will all at some point need accessible roads, accessible pavements, and accessible housing. That's part of inclusion. And that, I think, involves a bit of a mindset shift, and that's what our government is doing as we um, rebuild and recover, is to ensure that we look at different aspects, different facets of our community, and rebuild in a way that includes everyone. And again, a caveat, there is a lot more to be done. Right. <clears throat> so we surprisingly have taken up almost an hour. Did you guys feel that? I didn't see time passing at all. Um, we started with a tough question, which was about your superpowers, and we're going to end with a controversial one because that's how I like it. Um, and then we're going to open it up to the floor because they are here to engage with you all, um, and they will have questions that they want to ask. So the controversial question I have, and if we could keep it succinct, that would be great so I can stay within the hour, <laughs> is we're hearing a lot of rhetoric around taking care of our own. And that rhetoric will possibly increase as people feel the pinch of you know, the economy. Um, so the question is, what do you think about this statement? taking care of our own. Okay. Since I have the mic, but I will do my best to be, brevity has never been my strong point, but I will try. Um, this whole rhetoric of closing our borders, protectionism, isolationism, I don't think is what we stand for as New Zealanders. And, and so I mentioned previously about strengthening our position globally. Part of it is to be a responsible global citizen. We also need to look at population growth more broadly and look at how we invest to ensure that we have the infrastructure as people come to New Zealand to be able to live with dignity. Um, but I believe absolutely that we can do both. 
So um, it depends in what context you're talking about. Uh, looking after our own, are we talking about COVID coming into New Zealand? In that context, obviously, we have to look at it differently. When people are coming from overseas, if they are New Zealand residents and uh, you know um, uh, citizens that are allowed to come in, who else do we allow to come in? And in that context, I think people that are important to us, uh, people that are contributing to New Zealand, maybe we need to look at them also coming into New Zealand, but we will have to make sure that they enter into New Zealand in a way that is not risking New Zealand's safety. But when we talk about other international obligations, looking after other nations, New Zealand has been uh, quite uh, good when it comes to looking after other Pacific nations. We have played our role, in my view, in a, a real uh, good manner, uh, looking after other Pacific nations at so many different levels. In this time, you know, we are in 2020, we are part of this big, wild world. And we cannot imagine that we can operate solely and by um, you know, just operating within ourselves. We need to access that outside world because we are a country of only five million people. And anybody, any business that wants to flourish here, anyone um, you know, that wants to do well, cannot do well by just operating within New Zealand. We have to think you know, wider. We have to give them the ability to operate at that global level to bring this prosperity that we enjoy here in New Zealand. So it is a, a perspective uh, that we need to keep in mind that we are part of the global uh, world, a big world. We cannot operate by just being a small country in the Pacific and staying on our own. Kia ora. I can't believe there was three ways of interpreting that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go with Priyanka's interpretation and, and assume you mean in terms of migrants coming here, um, not in the COVID context, but you know when, when we get attacked. Um, so one of the things that I'm very, very proud of with this past um, term of government is that the, in the last budget we had, for the first time ever in the history of us having a refugee quota or family reunification of refugees, we not only doubled the number of family members that can be reunited with their refugee families here, this is like first degree family, family connection um, of a refugee who's here on their own. So it's just incredible for those lives to be able to be reunited, but for the first time ever, there's some resource for that to happen. And the fact that we did it in the context of COVID um, was just incredible to me, and it was a line item in the Green Party's confidence and supply agreement um, with our Labour Party government um, partners. So that really is, that that is what, um, what our government did and to stand as a counterpoint to the politics of you know xenophobia where there's people being ripped apart at the border of other free nations um we stood for, for values that are different than that and i absolutely think there is enough here for everyone it's an absolute um just a travesty that people will take advantage of migrant and refugee communities by uh, sort of oversimplifying complex crises like the housing crisis or the uh, traffic in Auckland or whatever by blaming migrants. And we all know what that feels like. We all also know that New Zealand has enough resource if we were to invest properly in people, um, which is something that hadn't been done for a long time before we came into government. If we invest in our infrastructure, in housing, in healthcare, there is absolutely enough for everyone and there's absolutely enough for us to do our part as good global citizens because we know that we actually do need migrants, we do need refugees. Refugees. We do need these diverse communities, um, it, it, which benefit us both in skill sets and in, in amazing cultural riches. So. Mm, kia ora. Okay, so we're going to open it up to you all now. I do have a list of questions here that people have asked us through Eventbrite. Um, but Yasser, would you mind being our mic runner if that's all right? <laughs> Just raise your hand so I can see you. I've got glasses for a reason. <laughs> uh, 
Kia ora, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Um, we've heard lots of big words being thrown around like unprecedented, extraordinary. So my question to the politicians today is, what would be your extraordinary politics in extraordinary times? So if you had to pick one policy that will win the hearts and minds of people going forward in the elections, what would that be? You know, for example, let's we housed the homeless during COVID-19. Can we continue with that policy? Well, and since we actually have a really comprehensive policies being announced in this election, I can <laughs> do it really easily. Um, so I would probably pick our um, poverty action plan because I do think that all New Zealanders do deserve a working social safety net, whether that's the disability sector, whether that's solo mums, whether that's people who are seeking work, um, and we haven't had that, and I do think having the lowest, um, highest tax bracket in the OECD is not something to be proud of, so I think we should take care of our own. Um, and I do think that we need to stop all deep sea mining, because the climate matters, and that's the actual existential, cri at least the central crisis that we're, that we're facing. So. One thing that I'll say, which uh, actually will mean a lot of things, and that is to let people keep more money in their pockets, th their own money in their own pockets. That's the most important thing that is needed in these difficult times. And what does that mean, actually? Letting you keep more of your money in your pocket, that means not increasing taxes. We know that the current government has borrowed $140 billion, and that is $80,000 per household, and someone will have to pay that back. So your pockets are going to get empty really soon, and we don't support that. A little bit of scaremongering there no, to so throw in. Um, I'm going to go with, I'm going to go, per household, would you mind not that? shouting me no, down? That don't, don't it's not very respectful. You said respect. Mm. It's about right. Anyway, yeah, um, exactly. I'm going to go with investing in housing, health and education. And I'm going to stand on our government's track record already, um, having made a strong start on that. Um, and, you know, stopping the state house sell-off. Uh, building more state houses just in the Maunga Kekia electorate alone. I was looking at some of those figures and we've built, we've got in train, um, uh, you know, about, I think it's about actually 1,500 um, houses. We're building 25 state houses a week um, uh, and we're building them well, warm and dry. And to me, once you've got housing in place, everything else falls in. Thank you. Okay. Oh, there. Hi, I'd like to ask, because you're talking about more money in the pocket, I would like to ask about tax policy. I'm from Japan, and uh, I think New Zealand government is very generous, not taking a lot of tax from wealthy, uh, high-earning people, even in OECD standard. Why is that so? And this is a traditionally welfare state, also um, in the capitalism, a very well run. But um, when government failed to uh, introduce capital gain tax, I was very, very um, disappointed. But you can still do it. Why don't you increase? Why nobody is talking about increase the tax rate for the um, higher earned? It's because there is an increasing gap between wealthy and the poor. And that is not very really New Zealand. Hi. I think we've got like a no, firm no, um, something else. Um, <laughs> the, I agree with you completely. And um, the Green Party fought hard, um, and we were probably the only party who really fought hard for the capital gains tax. I completely agree. If you, if your income comes from flipping houses. It's okay to pay tax on it. <laughs> it's just not, you know. Um, it, it's very, very weird to say that that um, the form of income being in capital um, means that you don't pay tax, and and we're living with a housing crisis. I think we all know that that's kind of what's massively contributed to the high price of um, 
housing, but even leaving that to one side, a fair tax system is absolutely essential to a country running equitably overall um, and a government being able to provide all of the services that we want um, to provide to everyone who needs it. Um, so capital gains tax and our tax policy is to raise the very top tax bracket to 40% um, and obviously that's on just the portion of their income that falls in the top tax bracket, not their entire income. Um, just, you know. Um, and, and then there's the, the tiny millionaire's tax that would affect 6% of New Zealanders on their portion of income or equity that falls over a million dollars would be 1% and that would provide enough for a basic income for everyone who needs it as a fully uh, costed policy, but I absolutely agree, the OECD, you know, the, the most mature, uh, well-functioning economies in the world run on higher taxes in their top tax brackets because that is the way that you provide an awesome public transport system and awesome hospitals and awesome uh, education um, for everyone because that's what we want for New Zealand. So. For my friend Gloria's party, they believe tax is love. <laughs> we don't believe in that. We don't believe uh, tax is love. And as I said before, uh, that capital gains tax, you remember last time, captain's call? What happened to that captain's call? $1,000 a day was paid to Michael Cullen to make a big U-turn to that captain's call. And so now, this election, we have no idea what kind of policies, tax policies, are going to be put in place by uh, the Labour Party. At least Green is quite clear about what they want to do. Um, that is a big risk for uh, New Zealand. So for uh, National, uh, that I am the part of, a very, very proud National Member of Parliament, we have said that we won't be increasing uh, taxes in our first term. <laughs> that is a good point. That is a good point. I'm just that question after first term. After first Don't worry. Priyanka, right. you, you seem to get cut out often. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I wonder why that is. Over to um, you. So I'm just going to begin, um, actually, with um, Hatch. You made a really good point. We do have comparatively very low taxes in New Zealand compared to other de developed countries. Um, and just going to Goldreza's point, absolutely a fact that we need a fair tax system in order to invest in the public institutions and rebuild and recover, as I've already gone into, so I'm not going to go into that um, um, in much detail. But what I will say is one of the first things that we did in government was to cancel the tax cuts that the previous government uh, had promised to the top 10%, I think it was, it was of earners in New board. Zealand. So that would, have been, that would have been tax cuts. That would have been tax cuts for people like myself, and I didn't need them. We didn't think that we needed that. We redirected that into working for families um, and into you know, the pockets of the most vulnerable and those who needed it, and put in place a universal best start payment for families with children so that they have the money that they need um, uh, to be able to live with dignity and that's absolutely what we believe in. Um, you touched on a capital gains tax and look I personally believe that the way however you gain your wealth that it should be taxed in the same way that income tax is but we all know that politics needs consensus and we didn't get there. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, sure. I'll just respond to this because I'll ask this member to go back and uh, yeah, yes, it will because you need to speak facts. Okay. Go back and read National's tax policy before making those comments. Yeah, that's why you keep making wrong comments because you haven't read that. Okay, got, can we, guys? I've got the mic now. I will actually come and you know do dance moves <laughs> between you two. So okay. I think thank you for the for those comments. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Rakana. Um, I'll start off by saying that I haven't actually read your policies on this, so if you've got something, that's great. But we're a room mainly full of women here, and you're women there, and we know that women are often more likely to have part-time jobs. And in all my work in the community, that transition from often being a mother to work is hard. And what's even harder is when you're on the welfare system. 
and the amount, so you might start off uh, um, w with a really part-time job, and I'm thinking about the future here, where you only doing 12 hours a week, maybe 15 hours a week, um, hopefully at the living wage. Now, if you increase that, say, to a little bit more, you'll then lose out on your benefits. And the amount that you can earn while you're on benefit and receive an income has not moved in, I think, a decade. And yet the cost of living have gone, come up. So it's really hard, especially if you're a small business or a small charity, of helping people transition into work or into their enterprise when there is no clear bridge, there is no clear pathway and temporary transitional support for that and that it's better off staying on benefit. So that's the abatement rates um, going up that you, I think, um, are mentioning. From memory, that was one of the recommendations of the WIAG uh, report, and that is um, a report. Look, what, what I will say is that I do know that there is work underway on a number of recommendations of the WIAG report. I can't sort of get into that in terms of detail here, but you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, if it, if it goes back to people being able to live with dignity, that needs to hold true wherever they are in their lives. And that goes right back to those who are on benefits, being able to earn enough to live with dignity. It goes to moving towards the living wage. And so we'd um, uh, provided, you know, we're paying the living wage basically to core um, employees of the public service. And I know there was an announcement today to extend that uh, living wage payment as well. And that's why we've consistently increased the minimum wage as well. I actually spoke to someone recently who told me, she was an el elderly lady, who told me the company that she was working for and that she had been working with them for 26 years on the minimum wage. And so if we don't consistently, and we proudly did that during COVID as well, despite um, you know, the opposition's, um, uh, opposition being quite vocal about that, because if we don't do that, you're right. And that, that goes across from you know, those who are earning to those who are on benefits as well, that we need to lift all of that consistently. Otherwise, these people who are on those uh, wages and also in female-dominated sectors um, f struggle to be able to make ends meet even. And we shouldn't be seeing that in a country like New Zealand. I think you uh, touched on uh, two very important points in your question. One is cost of living, and the other one is um, how do you survive within the income that you, uh, that you get. So I think it comes down to the cost of living issue that you raised. It's because the cost of living is increasing so fast, it's increasing faster than the wages have been increasing. But is increasing the minimum wage the answer? If you're not addressing the issue of cost of living? No, that is not. So if you reduce the cost of living, what will happen ultimately? If you're earning, for example, $1,000 a day, and at the end of the week, so $1,000 a week, at the end of the week, if you are minus $10, because your spending is $1,000 and $10, you're minus 10 in your pocket, that's of no use. But if you're earning $950, but end, end of the week, you have $100 left in your pocket, that $950 are better than $1,000 that you earn. Give you an example. You know, from 1st of July, four cents per liter, the fuel tax has gone up. That is the current government. They increase that fuel tax, despite not delivering on their transport policy that they promised to deliver using that fuel tax. Now, fuel tax is not simply fuel tax that you pay more when you get, uh, you know, your fuel. It's every item that you buy in supermarket that goes up. Everything that you use you on a daily basis, that goes up. Because when the fuel goes up, everything else goes up. And that is where the cost of living is actually pinching. The way it's going up, pinching families, and that's where we are hearing these kind of issues. And, you know, talking about business, you mentioned this word business. And if you increase the minimum wage, and if business is not able to absorb that, we increased when we were in national, uh, government, we increased minimum wage, but we increased in a sustainable manner. 
But if you come out sitting in Wellington, not having that experience of running a business, keep signing, you know, it should increase by dollar fifty, dollar twenty-five a year. Businesses take time to absorb that increment. If they don't have the ability, they are going to lay off people, and people will end up on benefit. Exactly what you said. People, I mean, nobody wants to be on benefit. People want to be in employment. People want to be in employment. And if you make it really hard for businesses through such policies, then they're going to lay off people. And it will be ultimately people that are going to suffer. Lowest unemployment is because of the nationals' work. We are going to see real unemployment, 450,000 people becoming unemployed after the wage subsidy scheme finishes. And this unemployment is not just because of COVID. As you can see, the GDP growth figures were dropping even before COVID. So GDP growth, yes, was around 4%. It's very hard to you know, um, uh, accept this, but this is the fact I'm talking about. 4% and now before COVID, it was just 2%. So that just shows how much income we all have already lost that was lost before COVID. And obviously the situation is going to get worse. And now we have borrowed $140 billion as a country, this current government. Who is going to pay back for that? If you are thinking there is a tree, we are going to get money from that? No, we all have to pay back. And you and we, we all will be paying, not just us, our future generations, our children and grandchildren will be paying for that. So we have to be mindful that it's very easy to throw money around that's not targeted, just to keep people happy. $20 billion in the budget was not allocated, which is going to be going out to buy votes. Somebody will have to pay that back, and it will be you your children, your grandchildren. Uh, uh, Kira, so we didn't borrow 140 billion. <laughs> billion. We didn't borrow 140 billion. Okay, can we, can so, we let go raise yeah, maybe? I, add I'm just going to bring it back to the abatement, um, the, yeah. the, um, the, the gap and, and um, the rate of the uh, benefit versus the... Um, the work that people are doing and how that impacts on, in particular, women being able to return to the workforce. So benefits are too low, and the welfare working group's recommendations should all have been adopted by the government. That's our position. That's, that's probably our biggest disappointment in government is um, that the punitive welfare system was, was not fixed. Um, that we had recommendations that would make our welfare system workable both for those who want to return to work and those who do need to be on a benefit. Because we know that some people just do need to be on a benefit. We don't need to haul in people with permanent disabilities and sickness every year and make them prove um, that, they, um, that, they, uh, that they have it. We don't need to penalise um, mothers uh, for, for not being able to name their, uh, the father of their children, which is one penalty we did get rid of. But we, we do need to raise benefits and we do need to help people to get back into work. And there was a recommendation on that and we certainly need to revisit that in our next term of government and adopt them all because it's actually not sustainable not to have um, a, a social safety net. But we also need to raise minimum wage. And the way that that works is that if supermarkets do put up the price of goods, we need that profit to be distributed fairly through our economy. That's how economies work. We've had international and domestic experts tell us that it's only when the bottom wage earners, it's only when beneficiaries have a livable income that the economy will become sustainable. It's about fairness and, and it's about a fair tax system. But if it doesn't trickle down into, into making our, our welfare system um, as strong as it needs to be, we won't have a fair and sustainable economy. Thank you. Oh, they've really made me work for my role tonight. I just want to point that out. <laughs> so um, I'm not going to go to the floor because I have one question. Um, and if we could maybe do a yes, no, yes, no to the question, that would be, yeah, that would be great. We can try. We'll try. Um, I really like this question, and that's why I think it would be a good note to end this evening on. And then, of course, they will be around for you all to... Um, have a little bit of a chit chat with them over a cup of tea. So the question is, do you think a woman of colour will ever have the chance to become New Zealand's Prime Minister? <laughs> <laughs> we need to 
that? Yes, no, yes, no would be great. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> I'll say yes, and we have to be optimistic. We need to work hard for that. We need to earn that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <woo -hoo>! Yay! <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for your time. I do hope you are going to be around for a little while longer to engage with our wonderful audience here tonight. With that, if I could just invite Rokana, the CEO of Belong Aotearoa, to um, do the word of thanks for tonight. Thank you. I was jotting down some notes on these post-it notes. I'll try and get them in order here. But um, isn't it exciting when there's a little bit of tension in the room? <laughs> and to me, it really emphasised the diversity of thinking. And I think that's important when we're talking about inclusion. And um, I also um, was, um, and I keep saying this wherever I go, because one of the other groups I'm involved in is a newer diversity group. And I first saw the um, saying um, where diversity is having a seat at the table, inclusion is having a voice at the table, but belonging has been heard. And if we think about the beginning of the superpowers, someone said a superpower is to listen. Um, so also on that note, I'm just going to plug a social campaign that we've got, which is um, if you could uh, like us on Instagram, it's hashtag pass the mic dot Aotearoa. And um, it's around, yeah, being heard and uh, being listened to. Also, um, I'd just like to remind you that if you haven't registered to vote, please do so by this week. Uh, make sure your dress is up to date and tell your friends and tell your neighbors because you have till the 15th to... Um, but you can register on the day now. You can, but if you want to make life easier... Sure, sure, sure. If you register by the 15th, then you get the card and then you can just roll up. And for the first time ever, we've got advanced voting. So from the 5th of September, you will be able to go and um, do, cast your vote and the two referendum votes as well. So I urge you, they're really trying hard this year to get as many people as possible, especially from the ethnic communities who are normally the lowest uh, turnouts of voting. So uh, please make sure that you're registered to put your vote, your power behind one of these gorgeous women who are up here. Um, so um, I think really I want to end with a blessing uh, to sort of dovetail the opening. Um, and I'm going to choose a, a Gaelic uh, blessing. But before I do, I'd just really like to, us all to give a warm round of thanks, of appreciation to the four fabulous women who are here tonight. Um, and, and also to the organizations, like events don't happen unless it's an organization that, um, with a couple of people in the background. Um, so, Pearl of Ireland Foundation. <laughs> and I'm going to try and get the pronunciation right here. And the Kadija uh, Leadership Network. <laughs> and, and give yourselves a big round of applause for coming out tonight. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. 
So some of you might uh, recognise this, and um, I think it originally came from the um, Isle of um, Iona, um, off the Scottish coast. I was brought up in Edinburgh. So, um, deep peace of the running wave to you, deep peace of the flowing air to you, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the shining stars to you, deep peace of the Im infinite peace to you. Amen. Over to you, boss. Thank you, Rokana. Um, just before we end, I just have some uh, gifts of appreciation. Can I have uh, Nazifa and Emine, if possible, to provide some gifts for our uh, speakers? This one could go to Priyanka because it's red. <laughs> uh, that one could go to Panjit, and that one could go to Golris, the second lady. And this is for Tayaba for hosting the panel and facilitating the event. And we could also have a group photo with our volunteer photographer. Yeah. Can we all, should we stand or sit down? I don't have a chair, that's why. Okay. Uh, thank you to our speakers once again, and thank you for coming on this evening.